Hello and welcome to the Ag Econ MT podcast, part of the Ag Econ MT project and website and the production of the Department of Ag Econ and Econ at Montana State University. I'm Kate Fuller, Assistant Professor and Extension Specialist, and I'm joined here by Anton Beckerman. Hello, hey, Anton. Hey. This is part of our ongoing series uh, to follow up on the um, Ag Outlook conference that we held on November 3rd. Um, so Anton's going to be talking about um, farm finances in distressed wheat markets. Um, so to, to get us going, do you want to just talk about a little bit about what has been happening in wheat markets this year? Yeah, thanks, Kate. And uh, I also want to just uh, give a, a very brief overview of the Ag Conference Uh it's in, in its 11th year, and it's a, it's a great way for us as a department to uh, get ourselves in front of the ag leaders and ag producers and agribusiness managers, ag lenders in, in the state and the region, and discuss our research and, and sort of the connection between our research and what they're really interested in, which is you know how to be successful in the ag sector. And it's, it's a great opportunity for us to discuss and, and share uh, our thoughts both on their sides and our side uh, about what's been going on and what we should be looking forward to. And so uh, my uh, my area of research, uh, a big area of my research is, is wheat markets and grain markets in, in, in general. And so that was the focus of, of my presentation and, and of course, the, this podcast. And one of the things that was really defining about Montana markets is I don't want to use drought because I think this year that has become a really, really bad word. Uh, so I'm going to use a very technical term, which is moisture under performance uh, that we've uh, experienced here in Montana. Uh, just to give you a, a, a little bit of a sense of how bad it was this year, since 1900, 120 years almost, uh, between June and September of 2017 this year, we had the ninth driest year uh, in over 100 years in Montana, in the major wheat producing area in Montana, and the second driest in the major northeast Montana producing, producing area, which is where we produce most of the spring wheat and pulse crops here in Montana. And in the past 10 years, uh, the average Montana wheat production has been uh, right around 188, 189 million bushels. Just to give you a comparison and, and an indicator of how bad it was this year, in wheat in general, so remember 188 is the, the baseline, we produced 127 million bushels, so that's, that's about a 32% reduction. In spring wheat, it was even worse. We had a 41% reduction in production of spring wheat. And if we look at the quality, which is in, in spring wheat and winter wheat here in Montana, it's, it's also really important. So the, the quality of the kernel, uh, we compete in global markets in the quality of the wheat, not just in the, the total production of it. We had only, the, so the USDA rated only 11% of spring wheat in the Montana and North Dakota region as good or excellent, which is the top two categories. And, and the remaining 89% was in the poor or fair or very poor category. So and that's very atypical for us. That's very atypical. Typically, we're right around the 40 to 50% mark of being in the good or excellent quality. So being at 11% is just, that's horrendous. So not only did we have low output, but we also had low quality. So farmers are just getting destroyed on in every part of the market. So it's not good. And, and of course, Typically, when we think about, okay, when, when we don't have a lot of production, we see prices going up, right? Lower supply, prices shoot up. And that's, that's what we saw kind of going in that June, July period when spring wheat reports were not very good. And then all of a sudden, the closer we started getting to harvest and, and then harvest started coming in, and we saw prices drop. And what happened was that the USDA, they reported a, a less than anticipated spring wheat reduction. So we actually did better than we thought. And a lot of that was uh, in, in that central Montana region. They did better than, than we had anticipated. And Canada in that Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta uh, areas where they 
produce uh, spring wheat as well, they did better than anticipated. Uh, Can you talk a little bit about sure. the um, the difference in the spring and winter wheat markets, and in particular what happened in Montana this year? Yeah, so uh, winter wheat. So these are two classes of wheat. Uh, winter wheat is planted sometime in the the fall of the preceding year, September, October, and it overwinters in in the ground, and then it comes up in the spring. And typically, winter wheat has has higher yields because it had a longer time to stay in the ground, a little bit more moisture. Uh, but the protein level, which is the, the quality indicator for wheat, that tends to be a little bit lower. So in Montana, we're right around an average of 12% in normal years. Spring wheat is a wheat that's planted in the spring, and it typically grows in cooler climates. So for example, Kansas, they can't grow spring wheat. It, it's too warm there. So uh, Montana is unique in that we can grow both winter and spring wheat varieties, uh, but with spring wheat, you need more moisture. So a lot of the spring wheat that's produced is in northeast Montana, where there's you know 14 to 15 to 16 inches of uh, rainfall, where in central Montana, the, main, the major wheat... Uh, winter wheat producing region, there's only 11 to 12 inches, 13, 14 inches, something like that. The, the drought this year, however, hit primarily that northeast part of Montana. And so the, the major spring wheat region and spring wheat has higher protein, so it gets a higher price for that higher quality. That region was hit the most. And so the primary kind of the, that, 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 competing product that, that Montana has a comparative advantage in in producing, that's the area that got hit the most. And that was the big dagger into a lot of producers' uh, hearts in terms of producing that high quality product that they can sell at a at a premium on the market. Yeah, this um, is definitely an upbeat upbeat conversation. This is this is yeah. I, we'll, we'll get there. We'll we'll get to the upbeat part. Uh, I think hopefully, um, <laughs> or at least less bad. Less bad. That's right. Uh, and just maybe to to pile it on just a little bit. Uh, We've had this, as I was saying, we had this really bad production year, but in other regions like Russia, last year they had a record-setting year. This year they produced an additional 330 million bushels over the record-setting year that they had last year. And so that wheat is flooding the market, and that's been driving prices down in, in, in the world. And of course, Montana, we don't, we, we're not like the corn and soybean producers in the Midwest. We just don't produce enough wheat to make prices go up or down very much. And so we're a price taker. And so we have been not only in the situation where production has been lower, but prices also decreased to points where are, are much lower than we should have if we have such a bad production year. So that's yeah. been tough. So so you've talked a little bit about what's happening in Montana and these um, national and global um, conditions, which are not um, really helping the situation. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about what this looks like in comparison to long term? So have we seen a situation like this before or is this really unprecedented? We've had similar periods. We've had similar years where production has not been very good. In the early 2000s, that's kind of the, the, the most recent one where production has not been very good. And, and we've seen, you know, probably every seven to eight to ten years, we see a really bad year. Uh, perhaps not to the extent that we've had this year where we've had, you know, a 30 to 40 percent reduction in, in, in output. But, you know, 25 to 30 percent, that's not unheard of every seven to 10 years. The difference is that we have more and more wheat has become a global market. And so where 10 to 15 to 20 to 30 years ago, uh, a bad situation happening in Montana wouldn't result in higher prices because of a lower supply and and not a lot of other global players who could you know export wheat to uh, either the United States or to other places where the U.S. has been exporting wheat. Now we have Russia, we have China becoming much more self-sustainable, uh, we have the, uh, South America becoming a, a, a big player, Canada is, is always in the mix, and so what happens in Montana is very localized, and we might have a situation like we did this year where both production and prices are low. And I think that is the the thing that's hitting the pocketbooks very hard, where in the past, when we've had poor production, prices were 
likely higher to account for that low low supply. Now we don't have that situation. Sure. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's a kind of an interesting combination of it being a really localized situation, but. The export market is so important to us. We export the vast majority of our of our wheat, and so um, that international uh, marketplace is um, th- that combination is really difficult. It is, and and when you you know as a state, when you export seventy five to eighty percent of your wheat, and as a region, when you export you know right around that amount, maybe a little bit less, uh, that's that's a huge market to compete in, and you know we the U.S. produces. Eight to ten percent of global wheat. We're not a major competitor. We're an important competitor, but we're not a major one. And so it's it's very difficult to look at what happens to us and think that we are the price drivers. We're not. We are price takers. So the market situation for producers that really focus on wheat in particular is is not looking very good this year. What what has been the response in the ag financial sector? You know, what's happening to wheat, we've also seen happen in other crops as well. So, you know, corn has has had a a very good production year, uh, but prices have been low. Soybeans have been, you know, lower than in the past few years. And in combination, if if you look at what's been happening to land values, especially in the Midwest, and uh, to livestock prices, in general, what's happening with the response in the ag uh, finance sector has been... uh, you know, complementary to what's been happening in ag markets. Um, there's a really nice survey that's out there that's uh, conducted by Creighton University, and they look at, it's called the Rural Economy Survey, and they survey ag lenders in the rural communities in, in a lot of these agricultural uh, states and counties, and they get, they get what they want to do is get a sense of economic well-being in these communities and and especially within the ag finance and ag lending sector. And what we found is uh, what we would expect, low prices, uh, borrowing has continued to be strong, so uh, producers are trying to overcome some of those low prices. Over 50% of of banks are restructuring farm loans and have restructured in September of 2017 and have been doing so consistently over the past several months. Uh, That's on the high side. That's a lot of restructuring. Um, We don't want to see that number being certainly not over 50%. Uh, and in response, banks have made it tougher to get loans in this particular month of September. Nearly 20% of banks increased the the, the requirements for collateral, so farmers have to uh, show that if they default, they have more assets to to uh, you know potentially repay the loans that they took out. And we've seen, and this is one of the more encouraging uh, uh, news items, is that we we see a little bit of an increase in farm loan defaults and delinquencies, but it's not that much. It's 2 to 4%. So that's a really good sign that, you know, yes, times are hard, prices are low, production is not very good, but farmers uh, have done enough over the past several years to, you know, have some sort of safety net on their own to repay some of these operating loans that are out there. Okay, so so would you classify these as freak out numbers or non freak out numbers? You know, I don't think these are freak out numbers quite yet. Uh, you know, this is not this is we're not in the eighties. We're not going back to the eighties. That this is not the farm crises that we've seen thirty years ago, uh, where you know you had huge uh, delinquencies and huge numbers of farm loan default and foreclosures and bankruptcies, we're not here yet. We're in a much better place because ag lenders have learned from those lessons, producers have learned from those lessons. So these are important numbers, but I don't think they're anything to freak out about quite yet. If we see several continuing years of this, then let's do another podcast and we can freak out. But I I, I think we're okay right now. Okay. Um, So what about the state of the the ag financial sector from farmers perspective what, yeah. are, what are they saying and and this is something that i really like looking at so purdue university has this barometer the ag economy barometer and i, I really love this measure uh, if you haven't seen it yet i really encourage you to kind of keep an eye on it yeah uh, it's purdue university and cme and cme so yeah it's pretty cool private yeah um public private partnership that's right and and what what they do is they survey farmers and they ask a whole bunch of questions about how those farmers see their situation right now relative to the past and how they see their situation going forward relative to right now. And what we've seen is, uh, you know, since about 2016, 
we've seen more and more farmers thinking that they're actually going to be less worse off. Now, we haven't seen in a tick up in the number of farmers who think things are going to improve, but at least we're not <laughs> saying that things are going to be worse off. So we're seeing a decline from about 70% of farmers uh, surveyed in, in sometime in, in fall of 2016. 70% of farmers said, you know, things are going to be worse going forward. And now we're at 40%. So we're doing better. We're certainly doing, uh, you know, not worse, uh, to, to use the survey uh, results. Um, and and it, it's not worse in, in both the case that, you know, looking backwards, farmers think that they're not worse relative to what they were last year. And producers are, are considering that their ag finances are at least going to be the same, if not better, going forward uh, a year from now. So those are really optimistic numbers that I see that, you know, and, and that's why I think, to, answer, to, to get, again, go back to your previous question, it's not time to freak out. Farmers are not freaking out. And so I think that stability in the farmer's perspectives are, is, is going to be picked up by the ag lenders, and they're not going to start saying, oh, well, now you have to give me, you know, your entire farmer's collateral in order for me to give you this operating loan. Okay. So, so it looks like um, farmers aren't super pessimistic. There's some, there's some room for optimism in these measures. Uh, we talked about this in the, the podcast that you recorded with me earlier in the, in the land markets. There's some measures that point to some sides of optimism as well. Um, but how can we actually measure these things? Are, the, are there ways um, that we can, as the nerds that we are, yeah. analytically measure this? Yeah, and, and as the nerds that we are, we, uh, of course, overproduced on the number of measures that we can look, look at. And so um, if you've ever gone to a, an ag lender, they're probably throwing tens, if not 20, of these terms at you and asking uh, all sorts of questions. Uh, the two that I like to look at, uh, to, to look at both short term and long term, are the working capital ratio and the debt to asset ratio. The working capital ratio is a short term measure, and and what it does is it looks at your ability to use your current assets that you plan to sell in the next year, so your crop basically, or your livestock, uh, and, and compare it to your short-term obligation. So the things that you have to repay in the next year. And what, what that ratio looks, looks at is how much, to what extent are you able to use your short-term assets to pay off your short-term short debt. And the higher that ratio, the better you are. So a good rule of thumb is a 50% ratio of that short-term assets to short-term debt, that's good. You're financially strong. Uh, lower than 20%, that's when you're looking at short-term financial vulnerability. Um, the debt-to-asset ratio, that's the, the longer-term measure, and that's looking at all of your assets relative to all of or all your debt relative to all of your assets. And uh, this is all of your loans, this is all of your machinery that you could ever, you know, if, if you need money, you can sell it. Maybe not immediately, but you can sell it. Uh, and, and so that looks at your long-term ability to survive financial volatility. And typically, less than 30% debt-to-asset is really good, over 70% of debt relative to asset is is not good. And if we look at what's been happening, um, the debt to asset ratio has been really, really stable. Back in the back in the 80s, uh, when all the financial crisis occurred, the, the debt to asset ratio was right between 25 to 35% for farmers. And that's, that's not good. Uh, it's not the over 70% where, where you're really, really vulnerable, but, but it's not good. Right now, over the past 10 years or so, we've been right around that 12 to 15 percent and and that's really good so that that gives you a perspective of look farmers have the necessary assets to pay off their debts over and over again and and that's really good to to hear so why do you think that is um why do you think we're so much better off in terms of that one particular measure now yeah i, I I mean, you talked a little bit about more stringent regulations of banks. Yeah, I, I think I think a lot of that was lessons learned from that late '80s crisis, where uh, 
banks put stricter regulations. Um, you also had in that 80s crisis as, as, as bad and, and you know, we're, we're economists, so we're cold hearted. Uh, but you had exit from the market. So you had people who foreclosed and, and went bankrupt and they may have been the less efficient farmers. And then you had consolidation of farms. And so you have uh, larger farms, they're more efficient, um, they they have fewer people, uh, so labor has been replaced with, with more capital, and so there's more regulation and more knowledge about how to be less financially vulnerable. So I think those lessons that were learned in the late 80s, early 90s, they have really, um, we're seeing the, the fruits of those lessons today. So I, I think that that was a really important kind of transition that, that happened in the ag sector, and and I think we're you know, it, it sounds bad to say it, but but I think we're better off uh, as the ag sector in general um, as a result of those lessons that were learned. Um, now, the, the problem is that even though those long-term measures look good, and on paper we might say, oh, no problem, you know, fine, prices can be low and, and we don't have to produce very much because our debt-to-asset ratio is low. If we look at what's happening to that working capital ratio, that, that short-term vulnerability, that's really been decreasing in the past five to seven years. And uh, we are now, on average, across the United States, we're now in the, the danger zone, which is under 20%, uh, which is where the average farm is financially vulnerable in the short run. So they're looking at not having sufficient assets to pay off their short-term debt, those operating loans, those uh, short-run um, agreements that they might have bought a new piece of machinery on a, you know, a five-year uh, term instead of a ten or fifteen-year term, and so now they're they're cash strapped to uh, to pay off those uh, th those loans, and so that's that's a really dangerous part. That in the short run, farmers are not as as uh, as strong financially as as we might think just by looking at their long-term debt-to-asset ratio. Yeah, and that's been on the decline for a couple of years now. It looks like it, it, it wasn't just this one year that was particularly bad. It, it, it has, and, and I think a lot of it, certainly a lot of it is driven by a decrease in, in prices in ag markets. We've seen in the past several years this, the, these declines after a, a number of years of very high prices. And, and I think what happened, and this comes out of um, research that was conducted very late last year in December of 2016, uh, by two folks out of Purdue, two agricultural economists out of Purdue University, and they found that you know a lot. Some of this is just farms just don't have enough cash on hand, and that's that's driving these financial vulnerabilities. Another, as I mentioned, uh, reason is that you know during those very high prices, um, machinery dealers made really sweet deals that said, "Oh, buy this machine," but you have to take out a five-year loan, not a 10 or 15-year loan, where the, the interest rate maybe is lower, but the repayment schedule is very aggressive. And so now that prices are not as high as they were in 2010, 2011, uh, you have farmers who are really struggling to pay off those short-term loans. You also have the situation where the larger operations, the more commercial operations, where farming is a full-time job, when prices are lower, they hit those operations much harder than those farms uh, where you know a spouse does off-farm work or it's a part-time operation and you can have stable off-farm income. And so you have some heterogeneity and discrepancy there in terms of who is more or less financially vulnerable. So what are some things that people can do to deal with these short-run um, issues. Yeah, there, there's three things that I like to think of and that I've seen in other parts of, of the literature that are typical suggestions. So one, of course, is because the debt-to-asset ratio is relatively low, one solution is to uh, reduce or transfer, transfer that short-term debt into longer-term debt. So if you have a short-term loan, you can take out a longer-term loan from another lending institution to uh, basically restructure your debt to a more long-term uh, uh, structure where, yes, your debt to S ratio might increase, but that's a long-term measure and you get the, the cash on hand to overcome those, those short-term financial vulnerabilities. Um, you know, another one is to just sell assets and, and to generate cash flow that way. The, the, the one thing, the one caution there is 
the value of the asset, that's not going to be the amount of cash that you're going to get because you will have to pay taxes on it. So you have to be really careful to account for that tax that you're going to have to pay on when you sell that asset. And and the easy, I guess, part is to just increase revenue, right? Or, you know, it's so easy. Um, of course, it's not. Uh, but increasing revenue and reducing costs uh, would, would certainly be an, uh, another option that you can have uh, in, in your arsenal. But of course, that's that might not be as easy as I make it sound on this podcast. What about diversification as a strategy? I know that's something that I talk to people a lot about in some risk management work that I do. What yeah. do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, I think that diversification is, is a really uh, interesting strategy. And, and it, I think as economists, we kind of uh, go from one side of diversification to another. In terms of you know, when you think about a portfolio approach, right, you always want to have uh, stocks, you know, a little bit of stocks uh, that are really aggressive, you know, the, the short term, uh, small equity stocks, and, and then you might have, want to have some, some government bonds that are never going to go bankrupt. Uh, so if, if you apply that kind of uh, approach to farming, you also might want to develop some sort of portfolio where you have uh, some crops that are always in demand and some crops that you might want to you know, experiment with. Um, so, you know, maybe you want to have a livestock and, and crop or uh, operation where it's mixed. It, it sounds good, uh, but on the other side of the argument is comparative advantages and specialization. And I think what we've seen in the ag sector is more uh, toward that end where you, you know, the mixed operations are disappearing and you're becoming specialized in one or two things that you produce. Um, and where we've seen, you know, back in the 1920s, uh, an average farm in the United States had seven products that they would produce. In the, in the 2000s, that number is now two. So an average farm produces two things, corn, soybeans, wheat, and peas. Um, we, uh, you know, hay and livestock. Uh, and so I think we've gone to that specialization model. The good news is, at least in Montana and, and in the Northern Great Plains, with the pulse movement that we've seen, uh, and, and Joe Jansen has another one of these podcasts um, as part of the series that talks about what's been going on in the pulse market, so I really encourage you to listen to that. But we've actually seen in the, in the past several years an increase in diversification. And so um, I think that's encouraging. And, and if we look at um, some anecdotal evidence, which is you know me talking to farmers, I've certainly seen and, and heard that farmers who have incorporated pulse crops or oil crops, uh, oil seeds uh, into their rotations, they've been able to sustain some of these more financially uh, troubled times more than or, or more successfully than those farmers who have stayed with the traditional wheat fallow rotation. And, and I understand that in some areas you can't go away from that wheat fallow, fallow rotation because you just don't have enough rain. Uh, but diversification and thinking about that might be a way to you know start going forward and and maybe in the, in the near to to medium run future become a little bit less vulnerable to these financial volatilities, which I think we'll see more of. Okay, so we just have a few minutes left here, but before we go, um, I just wanted to talk about a couple of factors that might influence whether or not these strategies are effective. So you you talked a little bit about um, planting responses, but also the the global and geopolitical situation that we're facing right now. Can you just uh, touch on that briefly? Yeah. First, going back to the diversification, it'll be really interesting to me, at least, to see what happens with uh, with responses. And and like I said, you know, you can increase revenue. That that's an easy way to get rid of this uh, short term financial stress, right? Um, and, and what we've seen in the past is, in, at least in Montana, so I looked at some data going back to the 1920s, and in the past when we've seen a particularly bad production year, we see an atypical increase in planted acres in wheat. So in, in general, over the past 80 years, about 1% a year, we've seen an increase in acres in, in wheat production in Montana. Uh, after a year, we've seen a 20% or more reduction in output. We've seen a five and a half increase in plantings in Montana. So we certainly see uh, producers respond. What will be interesting to see this year is because global wheat prices are so low, whether we'll see that response and, and whether those producers are going to move to other crops like pulses. So that, that's certainly one thing to look at. And, and for, for you, if you're a producer, to think about is, 
you know, what are the trade-offs of replanting wheat or maybe thinking about diversifying and going into uh, a different a different area, or at least with some of your acres that you, you may have planted to wheat otherwise. Um, another issue that, that certainly is on the top of the minds of the ag world in the United States and, and in North America in general is this idea of deglobalization and, and potential withdrawal from NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, uh, which is Canada, the United States, and Mexico. And that was a treaty that was uh, established in uh, the early 90s, and uh, it's been a boon for U.S. wheat and crops in general. Um, if you think about how much wheat is exported, 24% of, of U.S. wheat, uh, of, of world wheat is exported. Over 50% of U.S. wheat is exported. And like I mentioned earlier, 70 to 80% of Montana and Northern Great Plains wheat is exported. Um, but because of the uncertainties with NAFTA, we've seen Mexico and Japan, which have accounted for uh, about 20%, 20 to 25% of U.S. wheat exports. We've seen Mexico already withdrawing some of that demand for, for U.S. wheat, even though we're still in NAFTA. So they are hedging their bets. They're buying for the first time from Argentina. They're establishing corn um, uh, connections and, and agreements, medium, uh, short to medium run uh, corn imports uh, with Brazil. And, and so that is a real potential issue for U.S. producers if we decide to actually withdraw from NAFTA or if this uncertainty about what's going to happen to NAFTA continues. Um, and, and, you know, the, the last thing is, uh, I'll end on, on a little bit of good news, is we're, we're likely going to see uh, another year of La Nina. So what that means is a higher probability in the northern Great Plains for more moisture and slightly cooler weather. So the cooler weather, eh, you know, maybe we can live without, but um, the, the, the moisture is certainly after the year that we've had this year would be a really big plus for us if we get that snowfall and, and that moisture going down to, um, to those first couple feet of, of, of soil. Uh, so that's certainly something that the, the – you could look out for, and certainly in Bozeman here, we've had quite a bit of early moisture and cold in November, and uh, and hopefully that moisture is transferring across the Northern Great Plains to everyone listening here. It so. is currently looking like we might get some more. <laughs> yes, uh, that, that certainly is the case. All right, well, thanks a lot, Anton. We've got to wrap it up here, but thanks for joining today. Yeah, thanks, Kate. Um, and thank you for joining us for another Ag Econ MT podcast. If you'd like to listen to previous episodes or subscribe to your future episodes, you can visit the agiconmt.com website and click the subscribe to iTunes button. Uh, we also encourage you to read our blog posts, which happen every week, and we talk about all kinds of topics that are relevant to the ag sector in the Northern Great Plains. And if you have suggestions for future podcasts, um, or blog posts or anything else, um, you can contact us by email, Twitter, Facebook, or by sending us a note on the agiconmt.com website. Until next time, I'm Kate Fuller, and thank you for joining us. <laughs>